Welcome to In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson. Join Dr. Lee Magnus, Professor Emeritus of Bible, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible, both from Milligan College, as they bring you their thoughts and knowledge of the study of the Sunday School lesson for the day. Now, here is Dr. Gwaltney. Good morning and again and welcome uh, to In the Word with uh, Dr. Lee Magnus and myself and we're so glad to be with you and uh, today we have the last lesson from the book of Hebrews uh, and uh, we're not through with the quarter's work. Next Sunday we will enter uh, the world of the book of Revelation but today we have to wind up our discussion, Lee, of uh, this wonderful book, uh, Hebrews, we call it. And, and uh, we will now be outside of that development that involved, what, 10 chapters? Yeah. Uh, the first 10 chapters focus on, on the superiority of Christ to all things Jewish, because evidently the Christians who originally received this are slipping back into Judy, Jewish practice losing their focus on Jesus, losing their confidence that, that salvation comes through Jesus. And so there's a, this is a strong exhortation to uh, maintain that, their focus on Jesus and maintain their faith. There may have been some um, non-Jews who had been uh, kind of um, browbeaten into uh, a kind of pro-Jewish uh, lifestyle uh, too, I, Could I well suppose. Be. Yeah, the Gentiles, Gentile Christians read the Old Testament all the time because that was their Bible. Yes. Uh, and so they know about the law, they know about the characters in the Old Testament and if, if some very strong Jewish religious leaders were in their communities, uh, they might have just, as you say, kind of browbeat them and put saying, pressure on them. Yeah, to, to come back to Judaism. Would, wouldn't it be better, uh, you guys? You come out of this pagan world, uh, wouldn't you? Don't you think it would help you to be a better Christian if mm -hmm. you practice some of the Jewish things R rituals, along with us, laws, things yeah. like that? So, yes. at any rate. Um, we, we do now come to a new section. The first 10 chapters focused on Jesus' superiority to the prophets, the angels, Moses, Joshua, Aaron, and even to the sacrificial system. Uh, we didn't have a lesson on that, but that was in those that's first, involved, certainly. That's in those first 10 chapters. Now, the, the last chapters, 11, 12, and 13, focus on the implications of our faith. We right. now know yeah. the focus of our faith, the object of our faith. Now the question is, so what effect does this have on our lives? Yes. And we start off with the roll call of faith. Yes. And this is, uh, again, a way for the writer of Hebrews to make a strong comparison and then contrast. And so he says, yes, uh, let's admit it. Here are the heroes of the... Um, Old, uh, older uh, right. covenant. Right, and they also <clears throat> lived by faith. And so we also need to live by faith, not just have faith, but live by faith. Mm -hmm. And so we have this very powerful chapter 11. First is the definition mm -hmm. uh, the, the, in the early verses of chapter 11. Yeah. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it, people of old received divine approval. Yeah. And so the very first thing that uh, uh, faith involves is belief that God created the world and the universe and yeah. all that's in it. So we get, the, we get quite a list of... Uh, then we get people. <laughs> amazing list of people uh, who lived in one way or another by faith. They're not all perfect people by any means but they did open themselves to God's work among them. Well, the ones are there that you would expect to find. First of all, Abel, mm -hmm. who uh, was the, the child of Adam and Eve mm -hmm. of faith. Mm -hmm. Then Enoch, mm -hmm. and then Noah, 
Abraham. Been a lot on Abraham, the a big focus on Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, yes. Jacob. Oh, by the way, don't don't forget Sarah. Sarah, yeah. right. <laughs> I was, we almost left her. No, out, no, I wasn't going to leave Sarah out. Abraham and Sarah. Then Moses. Then Moses. Uh, Joshua is not mentioned by name, but in verse 30, there's a reference to the fall of the walls of Jericho, yes. which was, did take place under Joshua's leadership. And then comes another woman. One of the biggest surprises in the chapter is Rahab. <laughs> Rahab, and she is just simply referred to as just flat out the harlot. Yeah, or the prostitute, right. Um, then we have a listing of, uh, pro of um, judges, judges, mainly. Uh -huh. Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. Jephthah. <laughs> not that, that's what I meant. They're, they're not all necessarily uh, quite as heroic as we might think. Then uh, David, but, Samuel, and the prophets. Right from the from the time of the judges. Um, now there's a forerunner to this uh, listing of uh, great people of the past in um, the uh, wisdom of Ben Sirach. Which uh, we've mentioned that before. Maybe we should clarify that that book was written uh, by a Jew. Right? Yes. It's a Jewish writing. And he was a, for a teacher. Jews, for Jews. Yes. And it was written during the intertestamental period. Yes. And the book, Sirach, is one of the apocryphal Old Testament books. Right. One of those 15 books. It's that, a book of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And there is also another big book of wisdom. The Wisdom of Solomon is the name of it. And they're very similar to our book of Proverbs. Yes. If you read it, they would have that feel. And uh, the Wisdom of Ben Sirach starts out with some of the same figures and goes all the way through Jewish history right on up until roughly 200 B.C., which would be contemporary uh, with the uh, author. Okay. And, and uh, these, it focuses uh, on priests and people of, of that particular uh, role in Israel's okay. history. Now this, this list of faithful people in chapter 11 uh, forms uh, the background for the lesson that we're going to be studying today in chapter 12. Right. Because there's an early reference to a great cloud of witnesses as we run the race of faith. Right. And so some of these people from uh, the faithful of the old covenant uh, make up that cloud of witnesses, as it were. There's another part to the cloud that uh, uh, we should refer to. Uh, and and that, back in 1135, uh, about... Um, People uh, who in Jewish history were tortured and killed for their mm -hmm. Jewishness and the, for their faith, people who were killed. Uh, and uh, that makes me think of Second Maccabees. Uh, again, another writing in the Apocrypha between the Testaments. And uh, so not only are there the heroes and the victors uh, in this cloud of witnesses, mm -hmm. but there are the martyrs, the, martyrs. the Jewish martyrs yeah, yeah. as well. Now, as important as the people are who are mentioned in, in chapter 11, chapter 11 ends with these words in 1139. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better. There's, so that, that, better. there's that word better again. Yeah, right. So that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. So just as in the first part of this book, uh, the author said that Jesus is better than the prophets, Moses, Aaron. There's a sense in which our experience of faith as Christians supersedes even that of Abraham and Moses. And all of these, uh, and even the martyrs. Yes, because our f faith is in the better uh, savior. Yeah, who, Christ. the high priest who yes. is Christ. Well, why don't you read our passage for us here, All right. and we'll talk through it a little more detail. And then we'll, we'll make some applications of it mm -hmm. too. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, 
scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Well, That's not the a, end of the comment. He goes on with more, but... This is a beginning. That's about a, all we can get on the yeah, page. <laughs> this is a beginning of a whole series of closing exhortations that the writer gives to the Christians he's writing to. Uh, and it's marvelous. In, in an effort to get them to apply their faith to their Christian lives. And some of this is, is just really, it Jesus is, Christ is the same yesterday and yeah, today and forever yeah. and many other yeah. like statements. Our text begins uh, with a beautiful call to focus and endure. Uh, keep your focus on Jesus and keep running the race with endurance. Now, we, uh, you have done a lot of work in this area, and I think it would be helpful to our uh, viewers for you to talk about um, <laughs> Greek races. Yeah, the uh, Olympic style. Right, you know. right. Clearly, <laughs> our writer here uh, has been to the stadium and has observed foot races just as Paul had, because he uses the same metaphors. Well, he, he, doesn't Paul even refer to wrestling matches? He does, yes. So Paul was a real fan of sports in his day. Wrestling I, think, and, I take it he was an observer and not an actual uh, wrestler. Uh, I think that's true. Not many Jews participated in those uh, sports. But uh, this, this author has clearly seen them. And we see evidence of that. The great cloud of witnesses, referred to in verse 1, that surrounds the, the athletes are the, the fans, the people in the stands. And we've I remember there. the one at Delphi. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen, uh, that's the only one yeah. I've seen. But it's, mm -hmm. a, lot, it's a straight race course. And f uh, all the length of that race course, uh, there are on the side um, seats. Yeah, they're like bleachers, but bleachers, they're, yeah. they're made of stone. Yes. And uh, they go down both sides of the stadium. Uh, just think of a, a football stadium today, a high school football stadium with a, with a track around it. And think of the bleachers there. Yeah. It was very similar, really, in an ancient stadium. But uh, an ancient track did not go around the stadium. It was a single course from one end to the other. Right. So the great cloud of witnesses are the onlookers who are st sitting up on these steps. And applauding. 
and applauding and cheering. I suppose uh, there were various people who had various racers that they were All their favorites, yes, and there may have been some betting going go, on. Go, Lee, go. I don't know about that. <laughs> now, the next reference is throwing off everything that hinders and the sin that entangles. Now, what is this referring well, to? Well, this, this refers to the fact that the, uh, the runners took off everything when they ran. They, they, when they came to the stadium, they went into the equivalent of a locker room and there they would take off. Remember, the people in those days wore long robes, and so that would be very hard to run in. Right. Or even a short robe. And so they took that off and uh, would, would put it there in the locker room, and so nothing in, entangled. It's, well, did it also in, uh, include in their practicing, they wore weights uh, to strengthen the muscles yeah, and that kind of like thing? Yeah, just like people do today. They would walk with weights on or carry weights when they walk. And then when they take the weights off, they feel they, they can run Lighter. even faster. Yeah. Yes. But the fact is that, that Greek athletes did exercise and compete in the nude. And uh, I can see how that would, would not be too pleasing to Jewish people. No, that's why I say it's very, uh, very few Jews did that. The word gymnasium, which we still use all the time, is a Greek word that means the nude place, the naked the place. The place for being nude. The place for being naked, yep. So, but, but what's important spiritually is that uh, the, the encumbrances involve two different things. Look at the wording in verse 1. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin. Sometimes, yes. sometimes yes. I think as Christians, we think that the only hindrances that we have to Christian endurance, uh, to making progress as Christians, is sin. And of course, that does need to be removed from our lives, that it's a genuine hindrance. Right. But there are other things that are not inherently sinful that can also impede our progress. I think, for instance, pride of accomplishment. You know, uh, there, there's nothing wrong with looking back and thinking, boy, just look at what our right. congregation accomplished. Or just think about the, the service that we provided last year to the homeless or, or whatever. Another characteristic that every athlete has to participate in is discipline, mm -hmm. which means eating certain kind of food and not eating other kinds of food. Uh, and, um, and the hours you sleep, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are so many good things mm -hmm. that interfere with your athletic performance. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think you hit it on the head that sometimes the things you have to get rid of uh, are not necessarily bad, mm -hmm. uh, but some are. That's true. That's true. Well, then the next uh, reference, of course, it says, let us run with perseverance. And uh, so that's obvious. That's the running of the race. And they had a, a marble slab that was, uh, by the way, the surface that they ran on was hard packed sand. And it, so it, it had a little bit give, but it was pretty firm. And there was a marble slab that was down at the level of the slam and that uh, of the sand. And that's the starting block. And, and then they, they had little then uh, they ran. toe holes in them. They did. They had it carved in there with a little with a little toe hold. So they ran with perseverance. Now, verse two is is very important. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, because in those days they ran. Uh, they didn't have lane lines. There w there would be a, a straight line in the sand, and then for each runner there would be a little stake or a peg there. And they would fix their eyes on that peg and run straight for that so they didn't swerve or foul a, a runner or something like that. In, in keeping your, your eye uh, on the goal, which mm -hmm. was a peg, it was a uh, kept mm -hmm. you going straight kept and you kept you straight. from fouling others. Yeah. What, about, what if you did foul someone else in a Greek race? You were disqualified from the race and you had to pay a hefty financial fine. <laughs> yes, you did. So it was money out of your it was. <laughs> billfold. Out of your, your earnings, your past <laughs> earnings. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's the picture that we have here. Yes. But our writer takes and spiritualizes that picture to make the point that he's been making all the way through Hebrews. 
We have got to keep our eyes on Jesus. And he keeps using that terminology. And now we see um, a, a fuller explanation of, uh, of the symbolism. Yes, yes. Now, um, what Jesus endured was not just a foot race. At the end of verse 2, we see he endured the cross. Yes. And, uh, but then the author of Hebrews very quickly adds, sat down at the right hand of God. There's that exaltation language again. All the way through, from mm-hmm. beginning to end, yes. uh, this writer is really saying uh, the uh, very important part of the gospel is the exaltation mm-hmm. of Christ he comes to earth lowering himself, but then reascends mm-hmm. or ascends mm-hmm. back to a place of loftiness yeah. and occupies that now for mm-hmm. the rest of time in eternity. Yeah. And even if Paul is not the author of this, which he likely was not, uh, this writer shares that concept with Paul, who in Philippians 2 said that he was... Uh, you know, he gave up his divine prerogatives and emptied, humble, himself. emptied himself, humbled himself to the point of death, death on the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him. And, and at his name, every knee will bow. Right, right. So uh, this is very similar to yeah. Pauline thinking. Yes. Now, verse 3 is really important. Consider him. Keep thinking about Jesus. Keep your focus on him. Yes. Uh, and don't grow weary. Don't don't fall back into Jewish legalism or ritualism. And don't lose heart. Become disappointed. Right. I can see how, especially it appears that they are receiving a certain amount of opposition from some source. It isn't clear what. Right. Uh, but he is saying that there are maybe some pressures on you to become feeble yeah. and They're, weary and, and disappointed. Right. And then as verse 4 says, they're involved in some kind of a struggle. Uh, the, Greek, right. the Greek word there is a wrestling match. They're really grappling. So really, in something. a way of speaking, the, the physical uh, symbolism now switches to a wrestling match. Yes, true. Uh, it says your struggle against sin, that may mean their own sin or it may or the mean, sin of others or, against them. Uh, yes, or the attempt of other people to get them to sin, temptation right. to sin. At any rate, he points out that in contrast to Jesus, uh, they haven't suffered nearly uh, as bad as Jesus. They, they haven't got, come to the point of um, shedding, uh, having right. their blood shed. So evidently uh, martyrdom hasn't started yet right. among, among Christians. So you may think you're having a hard time, but... Jesus had it a heart a, a lot tougher. Right. And it's here that, that he, he uses uh, Proverbs chapter 3 to yes. enter this whole concept of discipline. He, he says we need to think of our Christian lives as a kind of athletic discipline. But then he shifts over into the family life. Yes. And family discipline. The father and children. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, he uh, then wants to give a new way of looking at difficulties that come into your life mm-hmm. as if it is an opportunity for growth. Now, when you face um, difficulty and uh, survive it, then that makes you stronger. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, that's what modern therapy is all about people who Mm -hmm. um, have operations or who uh, fall or uh, whatever uh, then go to therapy and they are no no pain no gain is the philosophy and a lot of that is resistance training isn't it yes you you have to lift the weight with your leg to try to get your knee you're building the strength of them of your muscles get your muscles and ligaments back uh, working properly and That's the language that he uses here. It's a new way to look at opposition. Mm -hmm. Don't see it as your enemy. See it as an opportunity for growth and uh, strength, building strength. And he also says, don't blame God when struggles like this enter our lives. Yes. Because uh, as he he clarifies down in verse 10, um, well, even before that, he says... Discipline and struggle in our lives is actually evidence of God's love. Yeah, 
verse seven, uh-huh. God is treating you as his children. Right. Uh, l- look at God as being on your side, not your enemy. Right. That God is um, cheering you on and is helping you and mm-hmm. giving you the strength to survive the difficulty, whatever it may be. Right. And then down in verse 10, he, he says uh, the reason we need to think of divine discipline positively is that God disciplines us for our good, and then for the, our betterment. Uh, and then the last part of that line, mm-hmm. I think, is really a marvelous thought mm-hmm. because uh, we may share in God's holiness. Isn't that interesting that discipline is a way for us to grow to be more like God? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now, this is r- remarkably similar to an idea in the old Levitical code mm-hmm. where God says... Uh, you shall be, uh, you know, holy because mm-hmm. I, Yahweh, your God, am holy. Mm-hmm. So I want you to be like I am hmm. in that regard. Mm-hmm. Set apart. Holy means set apart for goodness mm-hmm. and not for crime and for evil. Mm-hmm. And that's a challenge. And that challenge is picked up uh, from the Old Testament in several of the New Testament writings as well. First, sure. First Peter uh, well, First plays, Peter is a whole epistle on the subject. On the subject of holiness, yeah. Yeah, yeah and suffering. Yeah. So uh, it, it's interesting. This author also makes that connection between suffering and divine discipline and then growth in holiness. Um, chapter it's 11. It's not pleasant, he goes no, he, on to he say. No, he admits that. It's, it's, it's not painful. pleasant. It's painful. But the outcome is so positive and so pleasant. If you can only survive it, yeah. you'll be stronger and you'll feel better. Right. Uh, yeah. And that, that goes for a whole lots of things that we encounter yeah. in life. Isn't this a beautiful phrase here in the latter part of verse 11? It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. That, that's really quite a beautiful, yes. Yes. beautiful phrase. Well, this is kind of a quote uh, in verse 13. Um, in our NIV um, text, we have it in quotation mark. Right. Make level paths for your feet. Say a word about that. That actually is the Greek uh, rendering of Proverbs 4.26. Mm-hmm. The word level there is the word ortho, orthos. Like in orthopedics. Orthopedics, orthodontics. And so it has the idea of straightening. Straight. Mm-hmm. Straighten your legs. Orthodontics is straightening your teeth. And then the word for paths is based on the word for run. So run straight Straight. is what he's saying there, yes. We're kind of back to the race uh, analogy. We are definitely back to the race metaphor. As we are in verse 12, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees so you can run the race effectively right uh, so that you're not disabled but rather healed my dad uh, always said this though he said you can get more corn in a crooked row than in a straight <laughs> road but i think the idea here is yeah. you run faster if you run in a straight line you run <laughs> you, you definitely do and uh, chapter 13 will we want to come in to our viewers they should go ahead and read the rest of 12 and 13 because it's more beautiful statements about how faith is not something that we simply possess, but something that we live out in our daily lives. Yes, it's um, some of the most beautiful uh, advice yes. that we can find. Yeah. Well, on this very positive note, uh, we end our discussion of Hebrews this morning. Uh, and you'll want to come back next Sunday because we'll launch a uh, a short study in the book of Revelation. Everybody's interested in that. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, and may this be a week of joy and peace in the Lord for you. This has been In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson with Dr. Lee Maggs, Professor Emeritus of Bible from Milligan College, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible of Milligan College. Join us again next week for another lesson from the International Bible School Lesson Text. 
This has been a production of the First Christian Church Television Ministries.